How do our most senior leaders feel about the direction and trajectory of our industry? What's their outlook on the future state of wholesaling? And based on their considerable experiences, what lessons would they help us all learn? That's what we want to find out in this special series of episodes we're calling Lessons from Leaders. Welcome to the only podcast on the planet dedicated to exploring the art, science, and lifestyle of wholesalers and their leaders. This is the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. I'm your host, the founder of Wholesaler Masterminds, Rob Shore. This episode of Lessons from Leaders is sponsored by the Money Management Institute and their Center for Distribution Excellence. MMI is the industry association that connects all participants, including asset managers, platform sponsors, and technology providers in the always changing and rapidly growing advisory solutions world. The new Center for Distribution Excellence, built by and for financial industry sales professionals, is dedicated to discovering, promoting, and improving best practices in the wholesaling community. In Industry First, the center brings together a comprehensive suite of events, networking opportunities, and educational resources, all designed to help sales professionals interact with their counterparts from across the industry and learn from the best of the best. For more information about the Center for Distribution Excellence, call MMI at 646-868-8500. That's 646-868-8500. Or visit mminst.org. I was, I was thinking just the other day about uh, the book, the book, Brotherhood of the Bag. Maybe you have the book. If you don't have the book, I welcome you to get the book. And every now and again, and not too often, thankfully, but every now and again, I, I get a, a message, an email from a um, female wholesaler, a female internal wholesaler, occasionally a, a female leader. And then, Rob, you know, I, I, they say, I'm not really pleased that the name of the book is Brotherhood of the Bag. Isn't the industry enough of a boys club? And you write a book called Brotherhood of the Bag. And, and, I, and I write back to them. I tell them if they, if they actually bought the book, they'd see this referenced in the book. It says the definition of brotherhood is an association, society, or community of people linked by a common interest, religion, or trade. Brotherhood not meant to be a reference to gender, rather a reference to the community that we all serve, this community of distribution. But one thing is for certain, and that is that female leaders, female wholesalers are underserved in our business. So our guest today is not only a outstanding leader in our business, she is a she after joining Congress Asset management in 2015 and steer took on the role of head of distribution for the firm she manages sales client service and marketing is responsible to, for developing and executing the firm's distribution strategy with intermediary and institutional clients she has over 30 years of executive leadership experience with a particular focus in creating and implementing growth strategies for financial services organizations She's held senior leadership positions at State Street Corporation, Fidelity Investments, and Dwight Asset Management. And today she is here. And Steer, welcome to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. Thank you, Rob. Glad to be here. I'm glad you could be here. So I want to talk to you today about these six questions. Listeners, if you're not familiar, these six questions are the same six questions we ask leaders in our business because we want to know what's on their mind. How do they view our industry and what's their outlook? So, Anne, let's just roll right in. Are you bullish or bearish on wholesaling today? I'm bullish on it, and I am because I think relationships matter a lot in the business. Um, you, advisors, say, you sounded a little hesitant, I got to tell you. you. You weren't like, you know, coming out of the gate a, a screaming <laughs> bull. I kind of heard in between the lines that there might have been some hesitation. What was in there? No hesitation, actually. I do think that it's um, like, like any industry – we have to continue to morph really rapidly. And we all know that the requirements for uh, being a good wholesaler have changed. Yeah. And the um, expectation is that people have a very high level of fluency in their products, but 
more important than that, they have to really understand what their advisors and the advisors' clients care about. So it takes a person who has a really agile mind and, you know, understands uh, how to listen well and how to take what they provide and make it relevant to the advisor. Agi- and I think... I want to I want to repeat what you said because it's really important. You said agile, listen well, and make it relevant. And, and, and I, I, I think, uh, I know that those are really uh, important characteristics uh, of, of wholesalers both today and into the future. If, listeners, if you haven't uh, captured the Cerulli podcast that we did talking all about their research that reinforces some of this, I welcome you to go back and listen to that show. That was Lessons from Leaders number three. Um, and uh, uh, please continue on that thought about your bullishness and the relationship nature, because I cut you off. Talk, talk about the relationship nature of the business. Well, when you think about just the environment in which wholesalers typically interact with advisors, um, there's a kind of disruptive nature to it. They, they stop by, um, their conversations can be kind of brief, and um, they're interrupting. And so the ability of someone to establish uh, a level of credibility quickly and to have something meaningful to say is so important. You don't have an hour to do that in most cases. And so it takes somebody whose adaptability is, is very high, who can read the signals really well. And, uh, and at the same time, advisors need to understand the products that um, they're buying into with their clients' assets. And so they do need to hear from good people who know that product well and know their business well. So I don't think the need for a wholesaling role goes away, but I do think that the skill set of a wholesaler um, is just the same as it is for an institutional sales role. Let me let me uh, transition you or pivot you from that discussion to a, a discussion that is important that we uh, reference here as we're privileged to have you on this show. How do we find more excellent women to wholesale? I mean, for as long as I can go back, the roles of wholesaler have been occupied predominantly by men, held the roles in distribution are occupied predominantly by men. Uh, I've been fortunate to, to work way back in the days of Oppenheimer Funds and on through on uh, and built organizations that had perhaps a, a, a higher than average uh, representation of women. Um, h- how do we get more women in the role of wholesaling? What, what, what should we be thinking about or what should be leaders looking for? Or is it just organic and it happens? I mean, I just want to touch on that if you would. Um, I think with a goal such as um, increasing the number of women in roles like that, it, it can't just happen. I think there's got to be a very active effort to make it happen. Um, I believe there is a view that a lot of people have of this role um, which has some truth to it, that it's, it's a tough role. It requires a lot of time away um, and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, interactions in the course of a day versus maybe a few really well-planned ones. And um, we actually have a meeting um, that the MMI is, is hosting in September in Chicago, and it's for uh, women in wholesaling because we believe that um, and it's a group of women who've organized it, that we have to take a much more active role in talking to people in understanding what um, younger women are, are thinking about when they're determining what role they want to, to have and maybe how we change some things. And, and it probably is relevant for men and women, but we have to reach out more and get women in this type of role. When I've hired for a wholesaling position, um, I didn't have any female candidates. No no candidates? No candidates. Interesting. Plenty of men, but no women. And it was was just interesting to me. We we were looking for the best candidate. We weren't specifically looking for a woman, but it was interesting. There were no female candidates. Let's let's pivot off of that, because I think it's a great natural place to go to the second question, because that's looking out five years how do you think our industry changes? And, and here again, I think we can, 
we can bifurcate that question. Uh, let's pick it up from the conference that you're doing, this discussion about women in distribution, women in wholesaling. Um, what's your outlook on five years out? How does our industry change relative or develop relative to women in our industry and then in our industry as a whole? Uh, when I think about what it's going to look like, I wish I had a crystal ball sure. because um, that would be amazing. But um, I think about it in a, a number of different ways. Um, one is through the lens of the client uh, as well as the advisor. If you think about the client, you have a group of uh, people who are um, are younger. They will have different expectations, I believe, of you know what they're going to do in managing, taking a more active role in managing uh, their money. Um, they will hopefully be more confident in asking questions, and they will have uh, a host of um, ways of, of looking at information that make them a more educated consumer. Um, I think that um, clearly in the past, and uh, you see this today in all the statistics, there are so many women who have had very very meaningful roles in, in business and, and other professions who take a very passive attitude towards managing assets. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful that um, that won't be the case with the um, millennial generation and beyond. So I think, I think they, um, they know that's a responsibility that they have to carry, um, even, even when they have a partner. Um, from an advisor perspective, um, I, they need to be really good educators and influencers of financial health, and that's uh, a huge focus of the industry today, and not to think simply about investments, but to think about the, the whole person and what their needs are today and in the future. Um, and that's going to require, for many advisors, a significant change in how they spend their time and the competencies that they have. Let me, um, let me take you back to one question I have around uh, the evolution uh, of, te of technology in our business, the evolution of um, urgency of communication in our business. Uh, and, and here's where I'm going with that. I was having a conversation with a coaching client recently, and he was asking me, you know, how many touches is the right number of touches to have against, say, your, your top 50, your top 100? And, and I, as I was reciting what has been kind of the mantra of, well, you know, six times a year is, makes sense for your most valuable clients, I started to think about uh, how many different ways there are to touch advisors today than there were, say, 10 or 15 years ago. You know, we, we can touch them, you know, through, through text. We can touch them through the website. We can see them live. We can call them. We can email them. There's all these different ways to stay in front of them. And if we're not staying in front of them, somebody else does. And while I have a senior leader on the line like yourself, I wonder if you have any, any moments of thought about that. How do you keep your best clients yours when the old paradigm said, well, if I see them in meetings and I see them one-on-one -on -one six times a year, I can insulate myself from the competition pretty darn good. But now there's so many other ways to touch them. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think one of the hardest things is um, figuring that out because people have very different needs. Mm -hmm. um, I heard a, um, an advisor talk about one of his largest clients who um, expected a lot of communication. <laughs> when the question was, well, how much is a lot? He said, we talk several times a day, which seems, you know, overwhelming. A bit much. Uh, I think that, I think you, you put a plan in place of how often you want to make sure you touch clients. The reality is when things happen, that are really meaningful, you do need to touch base with them. And that's unplanned. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I think about relationships that we have with our clients, there are you know, regular meetings. There's a certain um, cadence to how often you get in front of people. But when there are dramatic things going on in the marketplace, you want to make sure you get in front of them, and you may be doing it in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. So you may not be in front of them, um, but you're certainly sending them information or you're, you're putting information out via, you know, a video conference, whatever. Um, so you've got, to, you've got to have your plan, and then you've got to, to be able to, to react when something happens. What's one industry trend that's concerning you the most right now? 
decompression concerns me. Hear that, um, hear that a lot, Spe- especially when, when management fees go down to zero. <laughs> That's right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's it's um, a pressure that everyone feels. Um, and, you know, there's, I mean, obvious reasons why fee compression would be a concern because there's fee compression, there's margin compression, but it comes at you from multiple angles. And uh, I think one of the things that is so attractive about the industry that we're in is it's attracted some of the best and the brightest in the field. And they're attracted to it because it tends to have very bright people in it. It's very performance-driven. And so the qualities of it are, um, are very stimulating mm-hmm. intellectually. And when you start to have compression to a point where it, you can't rationalize actually producing a product... Mm-hmm or it constrains so much what you can provide to the market, i.e., you know, passive products, then I think we're not doing the job that we all set out to do, which is, you know, create a good portfolio of, um, of strategies for different clients. So that does concern me, because if, if you go down that road too far, then this is not going to be an attractive market. I was going to ask you, do you you have a thought on where this evolves to? Where does it shake out to? Uh, Maybe you do, maybe you don't. And if you don't, haven't thought that far, I completely understand. But do you have any thoughts on, again, when when you've got behemoths in the industry racing to zero uh, on management fees to capture their margin someplace else uh, within the transaction, where where does this end? any thoughts? You could, you, could, you could put yourself in a death spiral a bit with something like this and mm-hmm. say the behemoths have other ways of making money yep. that, um, that allow them to you know, lead the race to zero. Um, and that's, those opportunities are not available to firms like Congress Asset Management, which mm-hmm. is a boutique firm. Um, it could go in that direction. My hope is that um, that won't happen because other things become um, valuable and people recognize the need for different types of products at different prices. And, um, and, and if they, because if they don't offer that selection to individuals, I do think people will seek other options. L- um, let me nib- nibble on that for just a second because uh, wholesalers, my goal in bringing you these leaders, MMI's goal in bringing you these leaders, is not just to bring you leaders from the behemoths, is to bring you leaders from across the spectrum of asset management and other industry categories as well. And and Congress uh, is, and my last statistic is $11 billion assets under management. Is that still a fair figure? Yes, it is. So uh, what sort of value must a... Uh, We'll just use smaller uh, player, certainly smaller than a Vanguard or a Fidelity, name your poison, BlackRock. What sort of value must a smaller asset manager provide in this hypoth- not hypothetical, in this world where we're talking about, you know, there, there isn't a, another uh, business unit to make up all the margin. Uh, what sort of things do you think about as you think about the value that you bring to make up that gap in cost? You are selected as a, an asset management firm um, by entities that like the fact that you focus singularly on managing money mm-hmm. and servicing your clients. So in our case, there's, there's no one telling us that we can't follow a particular direction, and we have stayed very focused on the original mission, which is provide um, a, a good product at a fair price to our clients and focus on preserving capital. So the, the value that people say we bring to the table, so I'll answer it by turning it around and saying here's what they say to us, yes. is you, you, know, you have a group of people, there's a high level of longevity and consistency to the people at the firm, you have a discipline, and you follow your discipline. You do what you say you're going to do. Now, it doesn't mean that you know we're the top performer all the time by any stretch. 
but we do a lot to um, to mitigate risk. So I think you pick what you believe you're very good at and you do it to the very best of your ability. And I think there is value to that, that they trust you to do what you say you're going to do. Is there something that you do that wins favor with the client, the advisor, uh, separate and away from the asset management process? Is, is there something that we can win on if we're a smaller firm? Is there something we can win on if we're not, uh, if, if we're not uh, solely winning on uh, the investment management selection process based upon performance? Because I heard you say we're not always the top performer, and I certainly understand that. Uh, so w- what are the other variables? Because I think about other industries and you know, whether it's hospitality or, or you know, na- cho- choose your poison. There, there's places where people carve out uh, reputations and followings, but they're not exactly the low cost provider. Do you give thought to that in your role with Congress about how else we delight the client in addition to our prowess in managing money? Um, and, and I think there are multiple ways to win. Uh, so I'll speak to this firm. Mm-hmm. And as you noted, I, I've been here for um, a little over two and a half years. Mm-hmm. But uh, the people here like the firm. Um, it's a an atmosphere. It's not that we don't have disagreements with one another, but we don't have big egos, and that's unusual, frankly, mm-hmm. in our industry. And so I think the value, the the longstanding value, is the people seem very genuine, and they have. Um, a high level of kind of credibility and trustworthiness. Mm. And I think they're, they're regular people. And I think that when you come in and you're evaluating, is this a firm that I'm going to entrust with my assets or my client's assets, um, that matters. Like, do, do I like these people? Do I trust them? Yeah. Yeah. And I think here, um, there's, there's no pretense to be what we're not. And, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very consistent way of talking about who we are and what we do and the culture that we have in the firm. So if the, the one trend that keeps you uh, or, or has you most concerned is feed compression, let's turn that on its head and say, what one, one industry trend keeps you most excited and hopeful? The fact that we are doing something that's really important. Um, I'm, I'm not... Um, finding the cure for cancer, which is, you know, probably, you know, obviously critically important, but helping people with their financial well-being is a really important mission for society. Mm -hmm. And so we are a part of that. And I feel that that is, um, it's complicated. There's not one solution, so you need smart people thinking about different ways of helping different people meet their goals, but it's really essential for society. And I think the the fact that we are part of a solution that helps people think about how to be um, responsible and smart and planning um, their, their budgets and saving and looking to the future um, is extremely meaningful. It's one of those things that either gives you peace of mind or creates enormous angst if you haven't done it. Yep. <laughs> so yep. Very that true. I feel really good about. So let's, let's throw you in the way back machine. Uh, what, are, what are three things uh, would your today self tell your newer to the industry self about how to succeed, thrive, and get ahead in our business? One of the things that um, I've observed uh, with people who are successful and really good leaders is they are very acute observers of what works and what doesn't work, and they're quick to adapt. And so I would tell myself, spend time thinking about that, Mm -hmm. Um, more time than maybe about, you know, some of the strategic elements of things that, you know, really intrigued me when I started out in my career. Um, so, so that's one, be an acute observer. Um, another is, um, I think this is a, a, an ongoing life mission, which is don't sweat the small stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. It's a good way to live yeah. yep. <laughs> and what, a, a, any element of your life, but 
there's so many things that can distract you, and um, and you really have to um, let some things go, and um, and so that is that's one um, that that I would highlight, and then the third one is um, don't lose sight of the big picture, mm. um, because I think people can get so focused on their job. And with wholesaling, as an example, you can get so focused on your territory, which is kind of your little business, um, you can't lose sight of what the firm is doing overall and what the, um, the right thing to do is for the firm overall. I want to um, continue on, on the benefit of having you particularly on the show. Uh, what, what would your today self uh, tell your newer to the industry self as a woman in this business? Well, I will tell you that um, my role, um, I think about a couple years out of business school, was um, to be the first woman in sales for a large corporation. Okay. Um, and uh, there was no one who looked like me. They were all men who were at least six feet tall, a lot of them former Marines, and um, I'm 5'2", so (laughs) definitely didn't look the part. And um, I went into it um, with the view that uh, I was going to work really hard and um, that I would try to maintain a good sense of humor and a good sense of self in that process. And uh, I think... Those are things that kind of get you through tough times when, you know, there are people who accept you in a role like that when you're different, and there are people who are not. And you can't change everybody, um, but you can't be embittered by it either. Hmm. And um, I, you know, I tried to, I tried to live that and, um, and just ignore things that I couldn't control. And that's, that's just me. Um, I think everybody makes choices about what they do, but that was important in, in going into a profession that I actually hadn't thought myself uh, of myself as um, a great salesperson and finding that I really loved it. And I loved meeting the people and trying to understand their business and how I could help. Who, who was or is your greatest career influencer and why? This is a this is such a challenging question um, because um, I've actually had a number of people, but I will pick one. Okay, uh, um, and that is um, I worked in a one of the fidelity businesses, so it was the president of that business who was brought in to really look at a, a business that they weren't sure um, was sustainable, and so it changed the you know, some of the members of the team, and I was brought in. And um, what what made him such a, a really critical influence on me is um, very high integrity, um, very, um, very strong work ethic, a uh, lot of energy. He was um, very focused on all of us being the best in the business and the best we could be. Um, the other piece that I would, would note is he was a really good listener. Mm. He was an amazing observer of people and could pick up on nuances, um, way before most people could. And, um, he, he allowed himself to trust his instincts, which were almost always right. The other thing that he did is he cared enough about, my success and the success of, of other people in the business that he told you what you did wrong as well as what you did right. Mm. And there are people who can only focus on what you do wrong. There are a lot of people who can only tell you that you're doing a great job and not give you any constructive feedback. The people you learn from are the ones who do both. And they care enough and take the energy to, to give you that feedback. And so what I saw in him is a, you know, a set of leadership skills that I wanted to emulate. Well, you, you mentioned there were more than one. If that was the only one, he gave you a lot of gifts. That's a, that's a 
It Be- did. Beautiful thing. <laughs> Ann Steer is the head of distribution with Congress Asset Management, a 33-year-old, $11 billion boutique firm. Ann Steer, thanks for being on Lessons from Leaders. Thank you for having me. Wholesalers, come back next time for another episode of the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. For more information about Wholesaler Masterminds, visit us at wholesalermasterminds.com. Find the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify.